Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aaron Sheldrick, and I work for Reuters. Our speaker today, Leo Melamed, is recognised around the world. I'm sorry, excuse me. Is recognised around the world as the founder of Financial Futures. In 1972, when he was chairman of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, he created the international monetary market, the first futures market for financial instruments, which revolutionised global finance. Mr. Melamed is also a Holocaust survivor and his odyssey from Poland to the US in 1940 and early 1941 is an extraordinary tale that combines sharp wits and Japanese generosity. Mr. Melamed's parents, with a young Leo in tow, managed to outwit the Nazis and were given a transit visa by the Japanese Consul General in Lithuania, Chiyune Sugihara, who is often referred to as Japan's Osta Shinla. Sugihara defied orders and rescued thousands of Jews from certain death in concentration camps. Uh, Mr. Melamed will talk about Sugihara today, uh, and the title of his talk is One Man Can Make the Difference. He will speak for about 20 minutes, and then I will open the floor to questioning. Um, I have one more thing to say, and that is please check that you've turned off your mobile phones and other electronic devices. Thank you. Well, good afternoon again, and thank you for the introduction, Aaron. I think I've been here a couple of times, but the one I remember is a long, long time ago when I was um, visiting, maybe 10, 12 years ago, with a f foreign correspondent who said to me, what would you like for lunch? And I said, well, a hamburger would be OK. And he brought me here for a hamburger, which was very, very good. So that was my uh, entree to this premises. Now, I thank you for that. I'm very honored to be here and be with you all and to address the um, issue that I was asked to entitle. Well, if I have to entitle something, the title of one man can make a difference is so obvious to me um, that no other title would even fit for this address. Because the one man I'm referring to is not me. Although what I did did make a difference and it changed the nature of finance in many respects. But the person I am talking about is Chiyun Sugihara. Because without what he did, I or the 6,000 others he saved would not have made it and would not have been capable of doing anything. Because our destiny back in 1940, after the war began in September of that previous year, meant to all of us caught in Lithuania that there was no way out. I and my parents had escaped from Poland. Bialystok was the name of the city I was born in, a major city in Poland even today. And the Nazis came in, captured, as you know, Poland fell in something like three weeks. Our city fell in seven days. And they came in and they captured us. My parents were school teachers, Yiddish school teachers, but there was a big Jewish population in Bialystok, over 100,000. They were very active in social life. My father had been elected to the city council of Bialystok. My mother was a well-known person in the women's movement 
for women's rights, actually, in Poland. Imagine that in the 1930s. And I was seven years old. I had not yet entered school. Kindergarten, yes, but not school. Preparing for that when war broke out. And of course, war changed everything. My father ran with the mayor and the city council immediately because they were going to be used as hostages. And if anything went wrong in Bialystok, the word was that they would be shot. There were 20 of them. My father left with them. I recall the night he left. There was ak -ak sounds bouncing, machine gun fire through the streets. It was in the middle of the night. My mother dressed me and took me to say goodbye to my father. She didn't know, nor did I, that we would ever see him again. But the truck left with the 20 uh, civil servants. After that, the Gestapo came looking for him. They searched our house. We had a very little house, really only a bedroom, one bedroom, a living room, and a kitchen, and a bathroom that my father had built with a chain that you pulled out. This is the pride of the street. I want you to know an in-house bathroom was a big luxury at that time for people like us. I was convinced at that time when I saw him build it that he could do anything. And he knew enough to run away. And at some point, of course, the Gestapo came looking for him, but he wasn't there. They were very rough to my mother. And I'll never forget the scene. Since I was this tall, I could only look to see at their boots. So what I saw was boots. And then they left because he wasn't there. And my mother literally did not know where he was. That scene sticks out in my memory, even though it's so many years later. We got a phone call. We didn't have a phone, but a neighbor did have a telephone. And my father got that telephone through to her, and she came running to our house to tell my mother what my father said. And what he said was that he knew that Wilno, which was a neighboring city, Vilnius was a neighboring city, was going to become Lithuania the next day. This was part of a deal that Stalin made with Hitler in dividing Poland. And that we must take the last train out of Bialystok to go to Wilno because there he would be safe for the time being. My mother didn't hesitate. She packed a little bit of clothes because she thought maybe for a week, two weeks, it ended up being two years. And she and I went to the train, which was a scene out of Hollywood. Bedlam is the only way to describe it. And that train, which normally takes two hours to get from Bialystok to Wilno, took the entire night. There were bombs falling, and every time that happened, the train stopped. All the people were told to get off um, the train because it might be bombed. Then later, we would get back on. Harrowing, harrowing kind of events that stick out in a, a little boy's mind. <coughs> That was the first leg of a journey that took two years and ended up in Lithuania, in Kovno, where my father, together with many thousands of other refugees, stuck in this corner of the world, knowing that the Nazis would take over and that their life was in danger. And there was a rumor that you could get a transit visa out of Russia, because at that time, that's what it was, to Japan. A rumor. But when you're a refugee, 
and your days are numbered, any rumor is like a real thing. And you go for it. Well, my father went for it. And the gentleman that gave him the visa gave it out to 4,500 other people. The total number is probably close to 6,000 because kids like me didn't count as a person to get the visa. But we were there. We were tag-alongs. There weren't that many children. And I was one of the youngest in that group. Sugihara did something that the rest of the world found out much later. Because when he wrote to the foreign office in Japan, to which he reported, and said, I would like permission to issue these transit visas to these refugees. The answer was no. Do not do that. He didn't understand why. And so he wrote a second time and said, you don't understand. These are not criminals. These are helpless individuals that are caught and they are afraid of death the next day when the Germans come in. I must give them refuge with a visa. The answer was no, we don't want to get involved. He did that a third time, but the answer was the same. And then he called his family together. This is Chiyun Sugihara, had three kids. The oldest was Hiroki. He was five years old, and I was at that time eight years old. That's important because 50 years later, Hiroki and I met right here in Tokyo. I became his friend, and he became my friend. And to get, he had devoted his life to the memory of his father, Chiyun Sugihara. And he asked me to join him in publicizing, holding seminars, as it were, to tell the world the actions of his father. What were those actions? Well, the action that Hiroki told me about was inside the consulate, in there, with a family around him. Who was the family? His wife, three little boys, Hiroki the oldest, and his wife's sister, the nanny, no staff. And he said to them, if I follow the dictates of my government, I would be violating the dictates of my God. In other words, the moral issue here was placed strictly in front of him. Now, I want you to understand the difference between Schindler, who is a well-known man, righteous individual, and this takes nothing away from him. But Schindler had a personal motivation with the people around him, the Jews, were working for him. In the case of Sugihara, just the opposite. Not only did he not know any one of the refugees, but his own government had told him not to issue the visas. And yet, he said to Hiroki and his wife, even a great war warrior has pity on a fallen swear swallow. And we were truly swa fallen swallows. We had no hope, no way out. He issued the visas to the last moment because he was ordered out of the office. And the rest, of course, is history. We came to Japan. Japan's people opened their arms to us. There was no hostility. They were enormously courteous and gracious. They gave us food. They helped us get a place to live. We lived in Kobe for the next four or five months. And my mother, when the little boat that took us from Vladivostok, the, the, the great port of Russia in Siberia, came into Tsuruga, 
on a little boat that took three days to cross the ocean, said to me, this is the first time in two years I can take a deep breath and let go of your hand, and let go of your hand. In her mind, she had held my hand for two years straight because during that whole interim period, she never knew whether there would be the next day. We spent un, undescribable hours on the, air, on the train across all of Siberia. As you can imagine, a transatlantic, a, a one-track train took us, and that one-track train would get off every time the westbound train was coming through, so it had to leave room for it to come through, one track, across all of Siberia. And every time it went off to wait for the train coming on, my mother told me later that she never knew it would start up again and that we'd continue our journey to Vladivostok. You never knew. We did. We got there in April of 41. We got permission to come to the United States. There were 6,000 of us in Japan. Everyone applied to anywhere because this was a transit visa. In other words, it wasn't a permanent residence. It was to use Japan as a way to go somewhere. And everyone ap applied for permission to go everywhere. Well, the United States was the center of where people wanted to go. Out of the 6,000, only about 250 got permission to the United States. Where did the rest go? All over the world. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and a 1,000 of them went to China, Shanghai. And China also opened its arms to the refugees. And in fact, there's an interesting note to that. Because in Kovno, when the rabbi of the yeshiva came to Sugihara, the yeshiva was called Mir. The Mir yeshiva. Yeshiva means an academic place where rabbis learn to become rabbis, you know. And the rabbi came to Sugihara to ask for permission to get a transit visa. And Sugihara agreed to give him the visa, him and his family. And the rabbi said, no, 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 you don't understand. I will not take a visa unless you give all my students a visa. Well, how many students was there? And the rabbi said, 300. And Sugihara said, I can't do that. That will take forever. This was in the beginning. And the rabbi said, well, then I don't want one either. And Sugihara said, OK, then. I'll give you the whole Mir Yeshiva visas. The Mir Yeshiva, when it came to Japan, didn't get to the United States, but they were open to Shanghai. And actually, the Mir Yeshiva lived in Shanghai during the entire war and moved to the United States and then to Israel after 1949. It is, for me personally, a miracle, of course. How did this happen? It happened because one man stood up and knew the difference between right and wrong. It is a wonderful moment for Japan to understand that there was such an individual among the Japanese. I spoke yesterday at Waseda University. And there at the university, there came Hiroki's wife. Hiroki has passed on early cancer. Hiroki's wife, their daughter, the granddaughter of Sugihara, 
and the daughter's young girl who was a student at Waseda University, the great granddaughter of Sugihara. Sugihara himself went to Waseda, and that's the reason I came to pay homage to this man and this family. So one man can make a difference. What I did with my life, you know, I became a trader on the floor of the old Chicago Mercantile Exchange while I was going to law school. I graduated law school. I practiced law for about six years. But my heart was in trading. What I found on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange was a challenge I could not resist. They tell me I was a risk taker because of my exploits as a child, running across the world as I did, and learning what risk was about. Well, I don't know. That risk is quite different than whether a market goes up or down. Still, I love trading. And uh, by six, 1967, I was elected to the board. The first outsider to be elected who wasn't connected to um, the world that founded the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And I found, as chairman in 1969, an institution that was going nowhere. It traded some pork bellies. I was a good pork belly trader, high frequency pork belly trader, if you know what I mean. But the exchange itself was going nowhere. In fact, it had a terrible reputation. The Congress of the United States had outlawed onions to be traded at the CME group because of the way the board of directors handled the right and wrong of things. So when I became chairman, I was looking for diversification, something new. And what struck me is that agriculture in futures was the only thing used. At the Board of Trade, it was corn, soybeans, wheat. At the CME, it was butter, eggs, pork bellies, cattle. Why not finance? When I suggested that to the Board of Directors, they laughed me out of the room. They said, no, 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 you don't understand. Remember, I was in my 30s, and they were in their 130s. <laughs> and I didn't understand. I was a lawyer. I wasn't even an economist. So obviously, I didn't know what I was talking about. And so I decided that there was only one way to find out if I was right or wrong. I would go to the god of economics at my fingertips. The gentleman's name was Milton Friedman, who was a professor at the University of Chicago and world famous economist. And I asked to meet with him. He, of course, knew I was chairman of this little exchange. And we met at the Waldorf Astoria in July of 1971. And I said to him, I have this idea, but everybody tells me I'm crazy. I want to launch currency market and go into finance in futures. And he said, that's a wonderful idea. You must do it. I nearly fell out of my chair, right? I said, wait a minute, you don't understand. What I'm suggesting is finance in futures, which had never been done. He says, well, do it. I said, nobody will believe me that you said this, nobody. He said, just tell them. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. I need it in writing. Oh, he said, you want a feasibility study on why currency could make a good futures market? Is that what you want? I, I said, yes, although I wasn't sure what a feasibility study meant. But I said, yes. He says, well, remember, uh, I am a capitalist. 
Oh, I said, I understand that. How much will it cost for the feas feasibility study? He said, $7,500. Now, in 1971, $7,500 is a lot of money. I think his salary at the UFC was only 15000 so he was asking quite a bit. I shook his hand. I said, it's a deal. That study, his feasibility study, I used in every corner of the globe. And I used to make speeches like this. Listen, don't believe me. I'm a stupid lawyer. But here, the great economist says I'm right. And he says that currency will make a good futures market. It did, of course. And we went from currency to interest rates, from interest rates to stock indexes. And we built what is today the CME Group, which is worth how much? Remember, we paid $7,500 for that feasibility study. Today. The CME group is worth something like $22 billion. Now, that's what I call a good trade, right? <laughs> and I am here to tell this story to you. It wasn't easy what I did. It was difficult. It took many years. But it was done. And how could I do that if this great man did not make the difference. Chiyun Sugihara made that difference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'll now open the floor to questions. Uh, please put up your hand, uh, approach the microphone and state your name and affiliation. Uh, we'll hear from the working press first and then open the floor to a wider group. Who has a question? Yes, sir. Of course. <laughs> Siegfried Gidl, freelancer from Germany. As a German, I ask you, how are your relations now to Germany and to German people? I think uh, a lot, some people from, Jewish people from Poland, like uh, Arthur Rubinstein, he never went to Germany after the war. How is your relationship to Germany and Germans today? That's a great question. <clears throat> and I happen to have a very easy answer. Um, back in about, 1985 or 86, I went to Frankfurt at the invitation of the Deutsche Bank to tell them that they should open a futures market in financial instruments. Um, that, they were the board of directors there. And I gave them uh, all the reasons why Germany should have a financials market. If it was going to be a power within the European nation, I thought that a financial market there in futures would be of great consequence. And you know what? The DTB was born as a result of that. The Deutsche Turnbörse. It later became the Eurex, and on and on as it is today. So my answer to you is, uh, this is a different world. You cannot keep the the image of what I saw as a child for your life's um, imagination or memory. Um, I, I was able to divide the Nazis from the German people. Remember, there was a distinction here in Japan. The government said no. The people said yes to saving the refugees. And so, that distinction, I hope, is true many times. At any rate, the answer to your question is that I was able to do that. And as a matter of fact, um, have been to Germany more than once. Um, they once wanted, uh, Eurex wanted to merge with the Merck. Uh, we didn't do that. We bought the Board of Trade instead. So we, we did our own thing. But that's the answer I have. 
Anyone else would like to ask a question? OK. Boy, I'll, I beat uh, them while, up. While, um, while you're getting up your nerves, I'll, um, I'll ask. Could you talk a little bit, a, a bit more about Sugihara's life and times after, um, after the war and when he yep. returned to Japan? Well, unfortunately, he, until Israel, in about 1986, recognized him as one of the righteous. Uh, he did not uh, have a happy life because he was considered a traitor to uh, the foreign office. And they had given him um, a, a post far away in Siberia uh, that, of course, was not a pleasant thing to do. Um, so he did not have a very good life until Israel recognized him as one of the righteous at the Yad Vashem in Israel. And um, in similar fashion, I am here today with the director of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, uh, Sarah Bloomfield. I would like to introduce her to you because she can tell you what we did in Washington, D.C. in honor of Sugihara. If I may do that, Sarah, could you stand up and um, or get this microphone over here? Thank you. While she's at it, I might introduce the lady sitting next to her, which is my wife, Betty. Say hello. <laughs> OK. Uh, perhaps we should open the questions up to the whole floor. Uh, anyone would like to ask a question? Oh, yeah, gentlemen yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael Brook, I'm an associate member. Thank you very much indeed, um, sir. Um, I've been in Japan quite some time, and I was actually in Japan when the story of uh, Sugihara-san uh, became well known. And there was quite a lot of publicity at the time, including, I think, uh, an NHK drama about him, uh, which was very elegantly done. And um, as I said, I've been in Japan a long time, and it seems to me that particularly in recent years, Japan as a country, as a people, is less good than its neighbors at promoting some of the many wonderful things that it has uh, in its present and in its, in its, in its history. And I'd, I'd like to ask you, um, as a gentleman with enormous experience of both, well, the entire world, um, how you look at current world affairs and how Japan fits into it, and the extent to which Japan is doing a good job of developing its friendships with the rest of the world and promoting the many positives that it has uh, in its present and its history, particularly since the end of the war, uh, since, the end of, uh, since 1945. Um, how do you see Japan fitting into the world stage, and how good a job is it doing uh, in promoting itself as being the country that it is? Thank you. Well, actually, thank you for asking that question, because um, after we finish here, uh, I have an appointment to pay my respects to someone called uh, Abe, who happens to be the Prime Minister of Japan, who uh, invited me to visit with him um, on this occasion. And what I will say to the Prime Minister is exactly this. Um, we are very aware in the world and in the United States of the two and a half decades that was lost to Japan as a result 
of what was truly a depression. And we lament that because Japan has the intellect of the people, the abilities that we saw in the 80s, we saw the Toyotas, we changed the automobile industry. We saw the Sony changed electronics. We saw Mitsubishi. So this people, and I'm only naming the top names that come to my hand, head, but we know that you are talking about a nation of very capable people. Mr. Abe has done everything right so far. I heartily applaud what he's done. As a matter of fact, um, the last move of reducing the corporate rate of tax is exactly what I would like to advise our President Obama to do the same thing. I don't know if he'll listen to me. He has other economists. But Abbasan has done the right thing. And as a matter of fact, pre presently, my exchange, the CME group, has been in discussions for a little bit of time with the government of Japan and METI, the regulator of, our mar of markets in Japan, with an idea that they came up with. And let me explain that because you gave me the opportunity to talk about that. Um, Japan found itself after the um, horrible incident in the atomic energy um, accidents that happened in a terrible place because now it had to look for another way to get its energy to its community, to its business. And it looked to liquefied natural gas. And it buys liquefied natural gas from many, many nations. But they charge Japan a great deal of money to do that. So the Met, he came to us and said, you know, you have been very instrumental in creating markets all around the world. That's true. And it seems to us that the answer to our energy problem is liquefied natural gas. If we had a market of futures in Tokyo, that would help create a center of liquefied natural gas trading for the world. And in a futures market, usually over time, it brings down the price to the people. That's true. That's true for everything that we've ever done. It ends up lowering the cost of the product involved. And besides that, if Japan became a center of liquefied natural gas trading, it would attract other financial uh, uses and instruments, and it would give Tokyo a special reason of activity. I think that's a very good idea. The CME group is working with METI to develop this idea, and we hope to succeed here in Tokyo. So my answer to you, bottom line is, I don't look at the past. It was my answer to my German friend here. You can't look at the past. You must look at the future. And the future for Japan is still there and still available. You have the talent. You have the people. You need the leadership. I think you've got it with the present prime minister. So that's my answer to you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to ask a question? Please. Hello, I'm Daniel Eskenazi, a uh, freelance journalist from Switzerland. Um, you spoke about the economy and the market, but I would like to ask you a question regarding history. And I would like to ask you what Japan can learn from Germany in terms of looking back at history. <laughs> you know, um, that is a good question because if you don't know history, 
you will continue to make the same mistake again and again. The only way is to know your history and know the history of others and use that as an example. Because now, in retrospect, you can see uh, the Germans have learned their mistake. Remember, Germany at the time of 1939, when it invaded most of Europe, um, the people were intelligent, educated. It was a major successful nation. But they let, they let fanatics, fascists, take over. How did that happen? And it doesn't matter if they don't look at that, then it can happen again. I think the German people have learned that lesson. And I think that the Japanese have to use Sugihara as an example of what uh, they should not ever again do. So I believe that if they watch and learn from history, you can do better. Hell, I did it in a small way with an exchange that was going nowhere. If I just uh, didn't look at the history, I might have not tried to diversify. I diversified exactly for the reason that their history showed me that you can't rely on the past. You must look for innovation and the future. But you must learn from history. I think that's the answer I would give. And uh, I hope uh, that my message is well taken in Japan. Anyone else for a question? Yes, sir. I'm Rick Weisberg. I have a scientific editing and translation service, ELSS. And I'm a man of science. I don't know so much about economics. So um, Neither do I. I, <laughs> I I've, uh, so you mentioned the lost uh, time of Japan's economy. And, and maybe that was triggered by deflation of a huge asset appreciation. Uh, land prices and other assets were go going, rising out of control. And, but in general, is it possible that futures markets could um, accelerate or increase the, you know, the size of asset bubbles and the, the depth of the falls when things like that crash? Well, that's a very good question also. And that fortunately, I can say with certainty, there have been studies beyond your belief from every major university that I know of. Harvard, University of Chicago, Yale, Stanford, across the board, all of them have asked that same question. And in every instance, and these are independent studies, the CME had nothing to do with any of them, but in every instance of that study, the result was no. Every time a futures market succeeds, it lowers the cost of doing business to the people. It is a simple formula. And I have seen it operate everywhere. If, if a company that is doing business can insure its cost by hedging in a futures market, that means that it has extra capital that it would have otherwise held in abeyance in order for an accident or something to cause them to need that capital. But if they insured that cost, then there is this amount of capital that is freed up. And guess what it can do with that capital? It can build another factory. It can build a bridge. It can build a highway. It can build innovation, drugs, uh, medical supplies. In other words, what future markets do, not overnight, not in a week or two, but over time, what they do, every one of these studies says that the capital freed up is to the benefit of the people involved. You know, I gave this message, message recently, by recently I mean the last 10 years, uh, in China. Um, while Japan was not moving, I thought China was going to move. And you know, when the 2008 crash in the world came, the meltdown, 
in 2008. You're all acquainted with it. You all wrote about it, and you know what that was. Derivatives became a very bad word. And the Chinese who had been listening to me asked me that question. And I wrote an essay that I read to them. And the essay is called, Don't Blame the Pencil. The pencil is only an instrument. It's the writer that you can blame. If he uses the pencil badly and says stupid things, then stupid things will happen. But don't blame the pencil. Derivatives are today more in use than they were in 2008. In fact, the world cannot exist anymore. It is so complex. It is so unified that if it doesn't use derivatives to insure itself against disasters of one kind or another, it can't work. Because derivatives were not at fault. Ah, oh, some banks used it badly. They're at fault, they should go to jail. But the derivative instruments, they're not the fault. They're a way to ensure the risk involved in doing business. I didn't invent the derivatives, but it was a, a offshoot of the markets that we created. And there's one more thing I want to leave you with. In 2008, when industries shook the largest banks, Merrill Lynch, Lehman Brothers went under, Bear Stearns disappeared, guess what? The CME Group did not fail. None of its members hurt the CME group. All monies were paid. When, when Henry Paulson, the Secretary of Treasury, who launched the TARP to save the banks and other institutions, called me and said, Leo, do you want the CME included in TARP? I said, oh, no. We don't need any federal money, and we don't want any federal money, because we are not failing in any way. So our system of securing the market, in fact, became the hallmark of the Dodd-Frank legislation. In fact, that's what Dodd-Frank said. We want the system that marks to the market, and every day is paid for so that there is no default. Now, can I say that it'll never prove to be um, incorrect? Of course not. I'm not that stupid. Things happen. I don't know. But I know the history, and I know how it worked. And so I'm satisfied. Thank you. What do you think regulators can do to, to um, overcome or to prevent the human impulse um, from writing stupid things, to use your analogy. <laughs> I'm not a get great fan of regulators. <laughs> As a rule, I, I believe in the market itself uh, to find a way. Now, there are exceptions. 2008 was a terrible exception. Um, Alan Greenspan, I think, said that he was very disappointed. Uh, so was I. But he wasn't very disappointed in the CME. So uh, what, what regulators can do is uh, what they know. D but the unknown is something they don't know. And nobody knows the unknown. So can it be 100% certain? Absolutely not. Have they done, is Dodd-Frank a good thing? Well, some of it, a lot of it is unnecessary and will be a problem in the years ahead. The mark to the market rule, the system, that's a good thing that they adopted. Um, but regulators can only um, react after the fact. And they do not and cannot um, forecast. So the answer is no, it won't ever be perfect. Does anyone else have a question? OK. Since we're talking about futures, um, China's trying to build a futures market in everything from iron ore to, to um, financial futures. Uh, do you think that there will come a time when China challenges, challenges the big exchanges like CME, LME, uh, and others? 
or Shanghai, I should say? The short answer is yes, um, because um, there is no one that is safe from continuous growth. Uh, China is doing things very well. So is the CME. But is it potentially possible? Of course it's possible that uh, we will find a, uh, a bigger competitor than we are. I certainly hope not. And we've done everything at the CME we could think of to continue to hold first place. And we continue to innovate. And as long as we continue to innovate, it'll be very difficult for anybody to catch us. But, you know, I would never say impossible about anything. I am the first and best example of what is possible when everybody thought it was impossible. So that's how I feel. I feel we must always be on guard in the United States and in the world for the next competitor. Um, listen, Japan is a very good example of what happened when you stopped innovating. Someone took your place, didn't they? And someone continued. So China right now is in that position. I think it's doing quite well. It took over um, Japan as the second economy in the world. And Japan probably will never recapture it. But Japan can hold on to its second place if it starts now and makes re, rejuvenates this, the financial centers in Japan. Questions, anyone? Perhaps we should go back to the main subject then. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what you'll be doing for the rest of the week? You're going to visit um, Tsuruga. I am. Can you talk about that a bit? Yes, well, uh, the mayor of Tsuruga is really the person that started this whole idea of my of revisiting uh, Tokyo. I come to Tokyo uh, once every year anyway. But uh, because what we've done here is help some of the markets, uh, Tokum for one. Um, but his idea was that he wanted to make Tsuruga uh, the port of humanity because it saved 6,000 lives. And he wanted a, a higher uh, credibility and recognition of Tsuruga, and he came to me with the idea of would I visit Tsuruga and have a celebration for Sugihara if he arranges a meeting with the Prime Minister of Japan? Well, how could I say no to something like that? You know, I couldn't. So I said, sure. I didn't think it was ever going to happen, frankly. But it happened. And now, uh, tomorrow, I'm going to go to Tsuruga, or the next day, and celebrate the, the Port of Humanity with the mayor and the townspeople, and uh, celebrate the great name of uh, Sugihara, uh, one of the great righteous in the world. OK, another question from Siegfried? You said uh, Mr. Sugihara had a difficult life after the Second World War. Could you tell a bit more what, about his life and, and after the war? Well, I, you know, I wish I could tell you um, all of it, but, but I don't really know. I was, um, I don't, you know, every now and then when Hiroki would call me, I would join him. But he... Hiroki, I can tell you, devoted his life to the memory of his father. And um, his father, father was very, very uh, sorry that uh, the government did not understand his decision. And it wasn't until, in fact, the foreign world, not Japan, but the foreign world recognized him first. And it was then that the story began to make sense to the Japanese. And today, I believe it is well known. I believe that he's well regarded. So I can't tell you what day-to-day -day life was, except that from a, a point of view of mentally, he had to be disappointed until he was recognized by the rest of the world. One thing I can tell you for sure, he never, never doubted that he made the right decision. Never doubted it. That's what Hiroki told me. 
Yes, yes another one. My name is Ken Doi. Uh, I'm a re uh, personal researcher of uh, Sugihara uh, College. And uh, last time I visited uh, Yad Vashem, I, uh, I discussed with the, uh, the lady who is in charge of the display of the uh, Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. And uh, I, I expected a lot of the display of uh, Sugihara-san. But the reality is uh, uh, almost nothing. Uh, no name is on, in the uh, hard to find out the uh, name of Sugihara. And the reason is, as he mentions, the Japanese government didn't support. And uh, Hollywood was too strong to impress the uh, Sindlers, uh, the picture. And a uh, couple more reasons, but they have no uh, rules to change the display. It's a, a perpetual the display might be. So I I have a question. So how the uh, how is the Sugihara display the uh, uh, Holocaust museums uh, throughout the uh, United States uh, situation? Sarah, would you, would you uh, try to answer that because I'm aware of the things that you know, but you know them better than I do about how Sugihara is displayed in other places, and particularly at the museum. Can I, is it okay to speak from here? So I uh, cannot speak for other institutions, but I would say in our museum, thank you, in our museum, um, the we, again, to emphasize these people that did this, it's only about, I think, 20-some thousand people in all of Europe, so it's very, very small number. Um, we have a wall where all of their names are listed by country. And then certain names, we pull them out and we actually tell their biography. We can't do it for all these people, just not enough space. But Sugihara is one of those names. And of course, we did this major exhibition on him. And um, and he's online. I mean, that's the, the biggest popular, the biggest visitors we ever get. We get about 1.7 million people physically every year, but our website gets, I don't know, 15 million from all over the world. So that's the biggest exhibition, and the biggest place really to promote Sugihara now is online. Thank you. OK, well, I think that um, we're almost out of time. Um, we've heard a very moving tale of an extraordinary journey um, in a time that seems for many of us uh, an age ago. Uh, almost unimaginable, um, but uh, something that should never be forgotten. It's also a tale of the abiding nature of hope and humanity, um, and on that, that, there is a positive note. So on that note, I have one more thing to do, which is to give Mr. Melamed another reason to come back to Japan, and that is an honorary membership of the club for a year. So I hope you will come back and see well, us again. Well, I certainly will. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Best thing I got today, that's for sure. <laughs>